Aloha from Hawaii. Um, I am very happy to have the opportunity to talk about the new book, Non-Killing Anthropology, a new approach to studying human nature, war, and peace. Um, and here is the table of contents. And I am going to highlight the PowerPoint, which in turn highlights each of the chapters in the book, some in more detail, some examples in more detail than others. Um, and the book is dedicated to two people. Um, one is Glenn Page, and I'll talk more about him a little later. And throughout the talk, I'll talk about his uh, um, ideas as well. Uh, the other one is David Bidney, who was one of my professors in anthropology at uh, Indiana University, a philosopher by training and a brilliant scholar and lecturer, uh, really uh, memorable. And he wrote a book called Theoretical Anthropology in 1967. And this is a quote from it. Uh, I won't bother to read the quote. Maybe you can read it while I'm talking. But the essence of the quote is that we are in a period of crises, plural, and resources of human intelligence and wisdom need to be focused on diagnosing the crises and indicating the directions to try to resolve them. Um, and one other quote, this is not gender sensitive. It was in 1967. But at any rate, uh, this is what he says, and I'll paraphrase it. Uh, humans are always a problem to themselves. Um, and it relates to ideas, the way they think about themselves, and uh, those thoughts have consequences. In the case of Glenn Page, he had a thought one day here in Honolulu about why not have a non-killing society. And he then began to spin out and develop this idea. And from that has developed this Center for Global Non-Killing and the wonderful website, which uh, Professor um, Evans Prim uh, is in charge of and has done wonderful work in uh, developing and maintaining that. Here's another quote. This is from Michael Allen Fox, his Understanding Peace, which for me is perhaps the best textbook on the subject, particularly since it focuses on peace. Um, and he basically says that we really need to dethrone war and instead focus on peace um, and get outside of the box in our thinking, which is precisely what Glenn Page and his collaborators, his colleagues have been doing. Now, the purpose of this book is to explore the mutual relevance of anthropology, non-killing and peace studies and their interaction, which is synergy. Um, and that opens up all kinds of possibilities uh, for research and for teaching and even for rethinking anthropology itself in many ways. I distinguish <clears throat> between war studies and peace studies because what's called peace studies is usually really focused on war um, and uh, has relatively little to do with peace and nonviolence. And I wanted to stress that peace is more than the absence of war, just as life is more than the absence of death. So this synergy opens up a whole new way of looking at things 
in anthropology and beyond with great potential. And uh, this would include research and teaching. So let's look first of all, uh, each chapter in turn briefly and just the highlights and the highlights of the PowerPoint, which in turn is highlights of the book itself. And I hope that you will um, be encouraged to read the book itself. This is a UNESCO statement, and again, it refers to minds or thoughts or ideas. The way we think about these things, whether it's war or whether it's peace or the related phenomena. And war is not just a means to achieve peace. Consider, for example, uh, Dwight B. Eisenhower, the famous general and president of the US, a general during World War II um, had this idea, this fear of a military industrial complex. And to this, I add military industrial media academic complex, which is what it is in terms of the media, the television stations for news, which were really cheerleaders for the Iraq war when war drums were initially beating for that in early 2003, even before a bit. Um, the media in terms of Hollywood movies, uh, we'll refer to some a little later, and also the academics who are basically um, war propagandists and war facilitators in many ways, particularly when they focus exclusively on war and most of all, say it's a matter of human nature. Moreover, even after war officially ends, many people do not experience peace. And that includes veterans of the war with emotional problems, particularly PTSD, post-traumatic stress, disorder, which may last for a whole lifetime. Here is a quote about human nature. And basically that quote is saying that it is a central concept and it has a lot of consequences. A wonderful book. There are many on human nature, but this is just one. And of course, in your studies, you've probably uh, <clears throat> read about Hobbes and Rousseau as two opposing worldviews of human nature. Human nature <clears throat> can be violent and warlike, or it can be considered to be nonviolent and peaceful or either, depending on the situation and in particular the choice that is made. The existence of some 7,000 cultures in the world today, tremendous diversity and probably hundreds or thousands of times more that diversity throughout prehistory really testifies, proves the plasticity the adaptability and the resilience of human nature, plus the futility of simplistic biological determinism. This is Glenn Page. And his famous book that has now gone through 28 translations. So it's really reaching the world. And I think it's, I don't know that there's any measure of this, but it must be in a sense, revolutionizing a lot of people's thinking and hopefully organizations and maybe even government policy people thinking about non-killing possibilities. Glenn Page asked a pivotal question is a non-violent, is a non-killing, 
is a non-killing society possible? As an anthropologist, I automatically said, of course. And I could think of examples and we'll see some of those a little later. This is his definition of a non-killing society. And I'll let you read that because it's really very important. And there are such societies, they do exist. It's not simply a dream, something imagined. So human nature is non-killing and there is plenty ample evidence for that if anyone cares to look at it from these fields, not only anthropology, but also history and psychology. Page estimates that 95% or more of humans have never killed. That's not to say that some aren't indirectly complicit in killing. I'm sad to say, for example, employees in the weapons industry. Non-killing capabilities are daily realized even in violent or warring societies. <clears throat> For example, in Syria, there are the white helmets who during the civil war try to rescue people and save lives. In the midst of that conflict, soldiers have to be trained and conditioned to kill boot camps, yet many still resist killing. And even after killing, many suffer emotionally. And incidentally, even drone operators in the so-called war on terror may suffer emotional problems, even PTSD as a result, even though they're far removed from what is really happening on the ground to uh, terrorists and also to innocent civilians. Now, very positively, very hopefully, there is a paradigm shift which has been developing very gradually, not well known for some decades. And Glenn Page and your professor, uh, Evan Strim, are part of that paradigm shift. The Center for Global Non-Killing, its website, materials, and so forth. These are just two examples of recent books that are part of that paradigm shift. In anthropology, there are many books on the anthropology of war. And just is that this is just a sampling of some of them. There are not many books on the anthropology of nonviolence and peace. We'll see some a little later. If I could single out any one anthropologist as the founder of the anthropology of peace, it would be Ashley Montague. He was a public intellectual. He was even involved in television interviews late night shows and so forth, quite well known, a prolific author um, of books, edited books, his own books, and also articles and so forth. And these are some of the seminal books that he wrote. And uh, this one in particular, uh, Learning Non-Aggression is a set of case studies of non-violent society, non-killing societies. 1994, I co-edited this book, The Anthropology of Peace and Nonviolence, and these are others. Uh, and your professor also uh, edited this book, Non-Killing Societies, which is available on the website. Today, the closest thing to uh, Ashley Montague is probably Douglas P. Fry, who heads a um, 
conflict studies, peace and conflict studies program um, at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and these are some books which he uh, wrote, uh, The Human Potential for Peace, a popular version called Beyond War. And then in 2013, this massive edited volume, War, Peace, and Human Nature. And uh, he is really, I think, the foremost specialist on the anthropology of nonviolence and peace. Uh, Fry demonstrates in his work, among many other things, um, that a lot of past scholarship has really been contaminated by an assumption of the beast within, as he calls it. Actually, Montague refers to this as the myth of innate depravity of humankind or human nature. Fry demonstrates that humans are not inherently warlike. It's not biological destiny. Uh, humans are fully capable of living in peace. And he talks about peace systems, among other things. Now, in this chapter in my book, I look at the mutual relevance of anthropology and peace studies. And you can look at it in both ways relevance of anthropology for peace studies. And in particular, we'll be seeing that as we go through uh, these uh, slides in the PowerPoint. Um, in the case of peace studies relevance for anthropology, uh, it's rethinking anthropology, not by any means rejecting all of the wonderful work that has been done, but putting a spotlight uh, uh, on the work that is relevant to nonviolence and peace, human rights and related phenomena. The concept of positive peace can help facilitate this broadening and spotlighting of some of the virtues of anthropology. The chapter two is answering Glenn Page's uh, question is a non-killing society possible? It's no delusion, they exist. And here is a famous statement by Page. Our society, and I, I suspect perhaps more so in America than elsewhere, uh, this is something that should be researched, is this, also myth prevalent in the EU, the, the European Union, in New Zealand, in Japan, and elsewhere, in African countries, in Asian countries, or is it mainly Western or most of all, American culture? The idea that war is all of these things, ancient, universal, natural, normal, inevitable and might add irrevocable. It's our destiny because of human nature. You may have seen the film Apocalypto about Mayan civilization and warfare violence. It seems like it was made almost with the intention of insulting the contemporary Maya. It's a horrible film, I think. It's entertaining in some ways if you like to watch violence and war, but how accurate really is it? And it is part of this man the warrior myth that is so prevalent in Western media. It's also prevalent in a lot of literature, including by scientists and academics. The Darwin of our time, Edward O. Wilson, has written a number of books that really celebrate human nature as inherently violent, warlike, territorial, and so forth. There are chapters in these books that deal with that. And uh, I think it's very unfortunate because he ignores the literature on nonviolence and peace, uh, uh, non-killing societies, 
Um, and yet he is a famous public intellectual, basically inadvertently perhaps spreading misinformation. There is a Western cultural bias, or maybe it's mostly American, Western assumptions about human nature, unconscious and unexamined, result in selectivity and advocacy and exaggerate aggression. Some years ago, there was a book by William Golding called Lord of the Flies, which is Hobbesian, which takes the dark side of human nature and uh, exaggerates and celebrates that. And there were two movies based on the book not by coincidence, those movies produced about the same time as major wars in the world. And I would invite you to look at the dictated to war, why the US can't kick militarism, which is actually free online, an earlier edition of that book. It's a wonderful book and it's an eye opener. The US has been so much involved in war for so long in its history. There are many great things about America, but there are also things that are not great. It was built on a foundation of genocide and ethnocide of the first peoples of what is now the territory of America. It was built on slavery and so on. Those are not great things about America. And the country has never really faced this, acknowledged it, and uh, tried to make some kind of reparations. Douglas Fry distinguishes between man the warrior and the simple hunter-gatherer pacifist views. And uh, what is particularly important is Yellow here. He is an evolutionist as well as a scientist. He's not anti-evolution, but he's pointing out the natural selection by common sense, reason, ought to favor nonviolent conflict management and generate peace. And also here, he points to the cultural bias, selective use of evidence, muddled thinking, and so forth. And Fry, as well as someone we'll see later, Brian Ferguson, are really very objective, systematic, holistic, et cetera, in their research and publications, unlike many of the propagandists and apologists for war. Careless thinking involves defining too broadly and loose, loosely war. And I discuss the definitions of war in my chapter uh, one on peace studies in the book. And if you read nothing else, that chapter I think is, if I say so myself, a useful overview of peace studies. Also part of this careless thinking is conflating war with feuding and interpersonal violence. The very first study in some depth that I know of was in the Journal of Peace Research um, by um, in 1978 by David Fabreau. And he pointed to the absence of a number of attributes and also the presence of various other attributes including nonviolent values, conditionings, uh, prioritizing nonviolence. But there is one uh, Achilles heel or problem here. And that is the societies he dealt with are small scale intimate communities. What happens when you get to large scale societies like states, civilizations, modern nation states of today? And that's a whole nother uh, 
issue and uh, in a sense, Pandora's box. There are a lot of books and articles on the origin and evolution of war. Try to find literature on the origin and evolution of peace. Good luck. It's not so easy. In 1996, I played devil's advocate, although some people would say I'm the devil himself, in turning this around and looking at the natural history of peace and a positive view of human nature. Uh, and that article is available in the website of Bruce Bonta, Peaceful Societies. And these are the conclusions, the main conclusions from that 1996 uh, chapter in, in, a, in a book, actually. Um, and the bottom line is there is potential for the development of a more nonviolent and peaceful world. It's latent in human nature in many cases. And you can imagine it. You can find it in actual existence in reality. Now, in answering Paige's question, I look at, in particular, at three cases. And Paige had a logic of analysis. What are the conditions, causes, and consequences of killing, of non-killing, and as of the transition from one to another? And I begin with the Samai as a non-killing society. And we talked briefly about the Warami as a killing society that made the transition well documented to non killing. And then the Yanomami as a society that involves both killing and non killing. Robert Denton in 1968 published this book. There are also articles of his on the Peaceful Society's website. And that book in 1968, when is that? That's during the Vietnam War, or more, more accurately, the American War in Vietnam. It wasn't particularly popular. And Chagnon, Napoleon Chagnon, published his Yanomangu, the Fierce People book in the same year, which became very popular widely used within anthropology and cultural anthro courses in the US in particular, and very, very popular. Um, the Samai are a peaceful, nonviolent society, and um, they have means of nonviolent conflict resolution. Um, and Enton documented that Sometime later, Carol and Clayton Rorbachek went and did a restudy of the Samai and arrived at the same conclusion. And their conclusion um, also <clears throat> reinforced um, what uh, Denton was saying and what the Samai themselves say that they are a nonviolent, peaceful society, that they abhor any violence and avoid it. Uh, they condition their, their children, socialize and culturate their children in nonviolent worldviews and values. The Warauni were studied also, among others, by the Rorbacheks there in the Amazon in Ecuador, very similar to the Yanomami, um, and also have long in history been considered to be fierce savages. But the Rorbachevs went one step further. They compared the Samai and the Warauni. They found that they're very similar in culture and ecology, many aspects except worldview how they culturally construct reality and meaning, how they culturally construct their ideas about human nature. And that makes all the difference. 
Bruce Bonta is another anthropologist pioneering in this field of these studies and um, an annotated bibliography, if I recall, something like 42 different peaceful societies um, and other work that he's done, plus this encyclopedic website, Peaceful Societies. His basic argument is represented here, and in particular, I single out these religious groups. The Amish are especially interesting. In 2006, there was a horrific school shooting in Pennsylvania in the Amish community. Uh, five school children were killed in the shooting by an outsider, and several others were critically injured. The murderer then committed suicide in the school room. What did the Amish community do? Did they take revenge? Did they attack his family, his community? Except no, they went to his funeral to pay respects and comfort his family and give forgiveness. Think about that. What would have happened if after the tragic attack on the US by Al-Qaeda in 2011, what if the US had acted like the Amish? Would that have been possible? Is it even imaginable? What would have been the consequences? What if, for example, a special operations uh, soldiers were sent in and captured uh, uh, bin Laden and brought him to justice, not by killing him, by putting him on trial and uh, going to prison the rest of his life, being invited to write his autobiography and uh, being interviewed by sociologists, psychologists, et cetera, et cetera, to understand why did you do such a thing when previously as Mujahideen, he was a friend and collaborator of the US in Afghanistan against the Russians. That question of why is very seldom pursued and especially systematically in depth. Or what if there were a patient long-term diplomacy to try to deal with this horrific tragedy? I'm not by any means discounting or diminishing um, but what if there were other alternatives instead of 20 years of endless war, all of the killing and injury, not only of allied troops, but also of Afghans. The tremendous billions of dollars of money that went into that war, what if at the outset that money had been invested even via the Taliban for economic development, for education, if that were feasible, if it could be done diplomatically. Imagination, non-killing. There are so many possibilities. And the war in Afghanistan is not over. In various ways, it will continue, including in the minds, the emotions of people who suffered uh, from that war, Afghanistan peoples, as well as uh, the soldiers involved uh, in the uh, coalition. So peace is a condition of human society characterized by, this is again Bonta's uh, characterization, and in particular note the yellow, workable strategies for resolving internal conflicts and averting 
violence, socialization of children, commitment to avoiding violence with other societies, and so on, and Bonta's illusion. For these peaceful societies, violence is never acceptable. Responding to violence with violence is simply causing more violence. We see that in the last 20 years in Afghanistan and elsewhere, in Syria. Violence is never successful, it's never acceptable, never really an answer. You do not find peace by making war. Peaceful societies then provide nonviolent precedents, juristic models to think about, to try to develop policy and so forth. From the top down and from the down, from the bottom up as well. And the bottom up is really what the Center for Global Non-Killing is all about, um, influencing the popular the public, as well as policymakers and governments and so on, the United Nations, the European Union, the wonderful work which your uh, professor is doing. Raymond Kelly, and I'm going to skip over this because I'm running a little late, um, has a book on warless societies and the origin of war. And he builds on Fabreau, he does cross-cultural comparisons and he tests those against the archeological record. And he zeroes in on what he calls simple hunter-gatherers or Fry calls mobile foragers. Uh, there are other types of hunter-gatherers in which there is war, but among so-called simple hunter-gatherers, war is absent or at least rare. These are unsegmented societies. And these are his generalizations. And archeologically, and it's not just Kelly, but it's others um, find that there is absolutely no evidence of war until very, very late in the upper Paleolithic. And the human line goes back, Homo sapiens sapiens and before that, uh, about uh, 2.6 million years, but quite a long time. There's absence of evidence for war, and that does not necessarily mean that war was absent, but it doesn't mean that it was present either. And the archeological evidence is more and more accumulating to show that it's very, very late in human prehistory. Unlike E.O. Wilson, it's not eternal, it's not in universal in all societies. So here's Kelly's conclusions, and he points to human nature, that ideas about the origin of war are really central relevance to our conceptions of human nature. Chapter three, this is about non-killing anthropology. Is it just wishful thinking? And I'll let you read this quote from historians in a, a book, um, Non-Killing Paradigm, uh, again by uh, Evans, edited. So centering history on violence, conflict, and war ends up legitimizing, popularizing, and perpetuate, perpetuating war by marginalizing non-killing, non-violence, and peace. And this is not just history. It's anthropology, it's biology, and it's... Uh, other sociology, political science, and so forth. This is what Page 
was up against and has been pretty successful at critiquing and challenging in many ways. So nonviolence and peace are not rare. They're just rarely studied. And if you study only violence and war, this can lead to a distorted view of these many things, including ultimately of reality, of human experience. Non-killing at first glance to many anthropologists, what, what is all that about? But once you get into it, you read this chapter in the book, there are many possibilities. That's not to discount legitimate beneficial work on the anthropology of violence and war, which is very significant and meaningful. But it is to say, what if we shine the spotlight on non-killing? What happens? What is revealed? And one of the things that could be spotlighted is research, applied anthropology, and advocacy about human rights. And there's a lot of that that has been developing since the 1990s. I think it's Mark Goodale, Goodale who has uh, edited and written books about the anthropology of, of human rights, which are very useful. And doing this, taking a non-killing approach to anthropology can challenge some presuppositions, some myths about human nature, can develop new priorities for research and teaching, would potentially revise the curriculum in anthropology. It is perhaps radical, subversive, even revolutionary in a nonviolent way. Um, reinventing anthropology <clears throat> is one very important classic, uh, came out about uh, 1972 or so, and has been reprinted. A wonderful book about racism, colonialism, ethnocentrism in anthropology. Uh, very eye-opening. I first read it as a grad student. I encountered it by mistake uh, uh, in, uh, surreptitiously in a, in, a, um, in a bookstore browsing. It was never assigned in any courses. It's so critical of, of a lot of anthropology up to that point. David Price has written and edited books uh, looking at the role of anthropology in relation to war. And that's a very important subject to explore. Um, a lot has been going on. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, for rethinking the Yanomami, killing or non-killing society. This is from Jacob Pandian. And the gist of this quote is that anthropology to some degree, in particular anthropologists especially, have invented the Yanomami to conceptualize important social and intellectual problems of the Western human self, in particular sex and aggression. Um, and there's a lot of truth uh, to this uh, statement by Pandian. And Chagnon, Napoleon Chagnon, Lotus, the first name Napoleon, I think that has some relevance in terms of his orientation in his research. Um, this is a review of Chagnon's last book, his memoir, um, and Noble Savages. My life among two dangerous tribes, the Yanomubu and the anthropologists, are a dangerous tribe um, because a lot of anthropologists were critical of Chagnon in various ways. And uh, Beth Conklin, in reviewing this book in The American Anthropologist, points out how much 
the Yanomami have played an important role in anthropology, in theoretical debates, and in other ways, in introductory anthropology courses and so forth. Shagnon's book, by his own estimation, has sold three to four million copies. It's gone through six editions, and there are a lot of films that complement it. Uh, again, I talk at length about that in, in my uh, chapter four. But a lot of what he has done is really stigmatizing stereotypes. And these are some of them, including fears. His 68 book in a second edition, and then his recent uh, 2013 memoir. Are these fierce people? Give me a break. Really? A large percentage of Yanomami communities and society as a whole are children. And about half of the society is females. They're not killers. Elderly Yanomami are not killers. Not all male Yanomami are killers. Shagnon has a Hobbesian view of Yanomami, which is celebrated by people like Edward O. Mil Edward o. Wilson and many others. These are nine components of that Hobbesian view of Yanomami, that they have chronic endemic ubiquitous warfare throughout time and space. Warfare defined as organized intergroup lethal conflict that war, he broadens this, generalizes, overgeneralizes to say war is an innate drive inherent in human nature in his 1988 article in Science. These nine points all are false, not just problematic. They can readily be refuted with science, with logical reasoning and argumentation. Nevertheless, I would invite you to look at the special event on EDGE online. Uh, just search Google EDGE and Napoleon Chagnon, blood is their argument. And you'll see <clears throat> Napoleon Chagnon is the one with the red tie here. And um, there is uh, Steven Pinker, and here is Richard Brangham, all are Hobbesians, and you can see the interviews with Chagnon and make your own judgments. It's a fascinating series of interviews and discussions, readily available online. Here I have diagrammed in a kind of heuristic model, the Hobbesian Yanomami complex, We've already touched on a lot of this, so I'll skip over that. Now, what about realities of the Yanomami? They are an independent society. Blood group and linguistic evidence coincide with the conclusion that they have been independent for about 2,000 years. Their language is not known to be related to any other indigenous group in the world, in the Amazon. They're a sustainable society. There's still forests where they live. They haven't degraded it, unlike gold miner invaders, including in recent times. Reciprocity is really the uh, pivotal sort of cornerstone of their society, both in a positive and a negative way. They reciprocate violently to violence on occasion, not always. Their society is intimate. They live traditionally in a large round communal dwelling, which is open in the center. And there are no individual walls within the society and often not even around the communal structure. Often it's open to the forest and each family is centered on a hearth 
a fireplace with wood burning uh, for cooking and at night. This is a mountainous area, it can be cold at night for warmth and so forth. And one of the things that has struck a number of observers of the Yanomami is the laughter. They seem to be laughing more than they, a lot of societies, a lot of communities. I suspect that humor is a way of relieve, relieving tension in villages, in communities. But these are people, a few dozen, up to a hundred or a little more, where they have been missionized in lowlands, particularly, can be several hundred in a village. But these are small, intimate communities traditionally. And day to day living with one another, there are bound to be differences of opinion, disputes, conflicts. I think laughter is one way that they resolve or release some of this tension. In fact, rather than calling Yanomami the fierce people, as if any single phrase would do justice to them, but nevertheless, I would call them Yanomami, the laughing people, the comedians, the humorists, the jokers, uh, because laughter on a daily day routine, hour by hour uh, uh, matter, it is so prevalent and so obvious in their society. They have fun. They enjoy living for a lot of the time. There are primitive savages. Can you imagine? These are in school. They're using laptops. Uh, I've even re received emails from Yanomami in the Brazilian Amazon via a colleague in London who forwarded it. Here are Yanomami using a camera and taking films of other Yanomami. Uh, they ought to make films of anthropologists and of other outsiders. Here is a Yanomami trained in simplified tropical medicine, analyzing blood samples under a microscope, another one giving an injection. Uh, are these primitive people? Here is Davy and his son, Dario Kopenawa. They are standing in front of number 10 Downing Street, the residence of the prime minister uh, of uh, England in London and on a visit there. And uh, Davy was the prime author along with anthropologists Bruce Albert of this book, The Falling Sky, Words of a Yanomami Shaman. Um, it's a wonderful book and I highly recommend it. And there's a whole chapter on becoming a, a shaman apprenticeship. And there are critiques of Western society as well and of Chagnon's work. This is a devastating gold mining that's happening and been uh, encouraged by the current president of Brazil. Brian Ferguson <clears throat> is the foremost specialist on the anthropology of war for decades. He heads the master's program in peace and conflict studies at Rutgers and he's published many things. Uh, edited books and his own book, including one on the Yanomami, where he re-examines Yanomami's so-called warfare and violence in terms of competition for trade goods, scarce trade goods, filtering in through trade networks into Yanomami and uh, competition, conflict and violence erupting over them. He even has an entire chapter on Chagnon. And he also edited this book, War in the Tribal Zone, uh, analyzing Chagnon's publications, but also a lot of ethno-historical uh, literature and ethnographies and so forth. And basically others as well uh, have case studies in this book. And this is really, uh, arguing that a lot of so-called endemic primitive or tribal warfare 
was actually generated by external forces of colonialism, or at least changed in form and intensity by the encroachment of colonialism. This really challenges a lot of the literature on the anthropology of war, ethnographies, uh, to relook, re-examine, was colonialism a factor here? Yeah, it challenges the idea that human nature is inevitably warlike. With Chagnon, there are 10 problems that identified in this 1988-98 article in the journal Aggressive Behavior. And number one is the fierce interpretation of the Yanomami, which I've already touched on. Number seven is male bias. Chagnon seems to portray or at least imply that women are simply productive and reproductive machines, automatons or robots without agency, without a role in terms of reproductive fitness from the view of sociobiology and so forth. It's a major uh, problem. And all of these 10 are various problems that I discuss and I thoroughly revised and expanded, amplified this article in the chapter in this book. Yanomami violence is limited because they, they don't really have a food surplus. Yes, they have uh, um, manioc roots, which are essentially stored, but, but that's just carbohydrates. That's not protein and other nutrients. Otherwise, they have no, they're stored in the garden. Um, and and uh, otherwise, there's no surplus at all that could sustain any regular warfare for Yanomami. Their population is overwhelmingly not killers, as I've already mentioned. Not all men engage in raids or in club fights or other kinds of violence. And it's not clear from Chagnon's quantitative data just what percentage are not involved in that. And also, <clears throat> I, I worked and studied with the Yanomami, lived with them, in 1974-75. So I have my own firsthand observations. And during the wet season, snakes are concentrated on higher dry ground. And so during the wet season, it's even more treacherous to walk through the tropical rainforest, whether it's for hunting or whether it's going on a raid. So during the wet season, there's very little, if any, uh, raiding. So if there is anything you might even imagine as warfare, it's seasonal, usually. Also, villages adjacent to one another or within some walking distance or even a, a day or so are usually friendly and allied uh, villages. Um, and they do have means of conflict avoidance, restraint, and management. You can detect some of this if you very closely read Chagnon's ethnography, but he doesn't highlight it. He doesn't emphasize it at all. It's not something that he really systematically researched in any depth. That could be a whole dissertation. And this is not just me or a critic here or there in some armchair speculation. Uh, Yanomami specialists who have lived and studied with the Yanomami, some for many years longer than Chagnon, wrote in response to his memoir a statement which is available on Survival International. And this is a quote 19 Yanomami specialists reject Chagnon's view of the Yanomami as a biased construction, representation, exaggerating violence, that they witness that the Yanomami are generally a peaceful people. That's very different than what Chagnon says. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So instead of being consumed by Chagnon's distorting fixation on Yanomami aggression, in chapter four, I focus on the opposite and try to decipher, detect, identify that in his own ethnography and examples of nonviolence and peace in daily life. And there are a lot of uh, details on that in, in that book. So there are lessons from taking a non-killing approach, Glenn Page advocating, let's re-examine the classics in political science and other fields. And I took that suggestion up um, in the case of the Yanomami and Shagnon's work. And it opens up a whole new perspective. And likewise, it can do so for other things. If we want to be more objective as scientists and scholars, we really need to try to transcend simplistic antitheses, dichotomies, dualities that can really be just distractions, unproductive, counterproductive. And these are many of them. Also, we have to avoid all or none, always or never, either or, and those kinds of uh, views. The chapter five, um, the role of spiritual ecology and non-killing uh, beyond the secular. And here is a quote from Page. The world religions all have some kind of principle phrased in some way about the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, it's common sense to treat other people kindly, gently, uh, try to understand their point of view, um, try to empathize, try to apply compassion. The Dalai Lama uh, talks a lot about this. Uh, it's only as the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. Uh, here's Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, they were simply uh, following this uh, kind of approach in their nonviolence and very powerful results. So my argument is that yes, all of this is great that Glenn Page and others are doing from, if it's a secular point of view, a secular approach, a science, a secular scholarly approach, but religion can be very important for many people, not all, but many. It's the primary source of their worldviews, their values, their attitudes. Often it becomes unconscious in the background, but it's still there motivating and guiding them in many ways. For those who are atheists, there are other ways of looking at things in terms of their worldview and values. Uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher, for example, was a pacifist. And uh, you could examine his uh, views. I think there's a book on, um, if I'm not mistaken, edited by um, um, Evans Pym on uh, philosophy, non-killing philosophy. And that book might talk about uh, Bertrand Russell. Um, in terms of um, spiritual ecology, you could look at this United Nations together with the Parliament of World Religions book came out recently, Faith for Earth, a call for action, which is free, available online. Just Google Faith for Earth. This is my definition of spiritual ecology from my book, came out in 2012, um, and gives a lot of background on the spiritual ecology approach. That chapter really goes into detail on that. Um, and basically, spiritual ecology is not trying to evangelize or advocate any single religion, privilege it, or whatever. Rather, it's saying, if you're religious or spiritual, then scrutinize your own belief system, your values regarding nature in particular. 
to see if you can try to promote a greener and more peaceful lifestyle and societies. One of the remarkable things about spiritual ecology is that science and religion and religions and sex within religions and the natural sciences, the social sciences and the humanities, sometimes these have been in conflict, sometimes some of them for centuries like science and religion, but in the case of what I call spiritual ecology, they find, can find common ground to collaborate because we're all passengers on spaceship Earth. And a lot of people increasingly recognize that. And of course, uh, global climate change is a catalyst for even more recognition of that fact. There's no planet B to go to. Um, we've got to do better on our home spaceship. And there's a forum on religion and ecology at Yale University, which has a wealth of information. And some people prefer to call what I say is spiritual ecology. They call it religion and ecology. But I use spiritual because it's more inclusive, because there are many people who are not religious, do not affiliate with a particular religious organization or identify with some re world religion, but who are still spiritual. Even atheists can be spiritual. Donald Crosby co-edited a book with uh, David Stone on a, I think it's the Rut Rutledge Handbook of Religious Naturalism. And this is Religious Naturalism. Donald Crosby also wrote its own book, but they co-edited this handbook they, a lot of them are atheists or agnostics, they can still be spiritual and have spiritual experiences in nature. One spiritual ecologist in particular is Joanna Macy. And uh, I think it was 2009 or so, and this is a new edition, her book, Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In without going crazy. It would be easy to go crazy with all the crises in the world today, and some of them seem to be getting worse. Uh, Afghanistan, I think, is not going to get better. It's just going to be a different kind of flavor of crises in the future. We're already seeing that. Um, Joanna Macy distinguishes between the great unraveling, the holding actions, and the great turning. The great unraveling, the main thing here would be global climate change. We're already seeing that throughout the world in the increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. Uh, hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, and so on. Holding actions. This is things like environmental laws, conservation, environmental demonstrations, and protests, and so forth. Uh, uh, the um, disinvestment in fossil fuels that many organizations are engaged in, uh, stockholders, and so forth, recognizing that fossil fuels are the prime cause of the uh, global climate change. Um, but these are superficial symptoms that they're dealing with. And Joanna Macy talks about the great turning that this industrial growth society needs to turn to a life enhancing society, which is really what Glenn Page's ideas and his colleagues are dealing with in terms of a shift in consciousness in terms of non-killing. She talks about structural changes. Glenn Page talked about that in his book and some of the other books there available uh, online from the website of the center. Um, and what I call a spiritual revolution, uh, a quiet revolution 
uh, Joanna Macy calls a spiritual revolution. Her active hope is not just theory, it is a very practical recipe for taking action and having hope. Finally, teaching non-anthropology. Um, this is basically chapter six is a uh, reprint of a course syllabus which focuses in. And one of the key in the beginnings is a true security quote from a wonderful Gaia Atlas of Peace, but, which is still very relevant. I wish they'd come out with a new edition. And note that part of true security is also spiritual well being. The Center for Global Non-Killing is a treasure. Um, it's just unbelievable to explore that and all of the resources and the developers and maintainers of this had the sense to make these books open access. Uh, so you don't have to have a lot of money. You can get paperbacks if you live with, wish, but those are fairly inexpensive compared to a lot of books. And the syllabus and the schedule could be, really be arranged around a lot of those publications. I do that in this course for anthropology. You could do it for political science, sociology, history, future studies, economy, uh, philosophy, etc. Using books on that website as a springboard and the bibliographies to develop a syllabus which includes other literature as well. And they're free. Imagine John Lennon's famous song. And I invite you to look at this YouTube or just search for it in one of the phrases. I don't agree with all of what he says. For example, he says, imagine a world without religion. Uh, I find that hard to do. He says, imagine a world without borders. That's easy to do because we didn't used to have national state borders. We had other kinds maybe of borders, but much more fluid and dynamic. Uh, and we could in the future with global climate change. I think that global climate change is going to be horrific. It's going to get worse. We're going to be impacted in our lives, let alone future generations. But I also think that it's going to be an opportunity. Rethink societies, economies, political systems, uh, our treatment of the environment and our spirituality and religions. Um, and I think it's going to be a catalyst uh, for the better, even though it's going to be horribly painful, a lot of suffering and death and conflict in the short term. But humans have a history, uh, our own species going back in terms of ancestry, uh, to about 7 million years when we separated from a common ancestor with chimpanzees. So uh, if you look at the long term and the, the way we've adapted and, and dispersed over the world and all of the things we've created, some of the wonderful things. Uh, in classical music, for example, one of my favorite composers is Sibelius from Finland. Um, and Grieg from Norway and Bach and so forth. Um, but anyway, Lennon says, imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Glenn Page was a dreamer. He was an imaginer and his colleagues or likewise, and I would imagine your course that you were studying is also imagining peace as well. So uh, lastly, I mentioned an article which is under review, invited for the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Anthropology, which is again, something else that is a free resource online. Hopefully it will be published by the end of this year. 
Um, it was submitted in, on in advance of the deadline of September 1st, and it is uh, open access. So you can Google for Cambridge Encyclopedia of Anthropology and, and find that in, uh, eventually, but also already there are many interesting articles available there. So I want to thank you for listening to this. And I really look forward to learning from you uh, in the discussion. Uh, any questions you have, I can try to answer. Any criticisms or rebuttals, I look forward to a discussion and maybe even some debate. And thank you so much to Jean, your professor, for organizing this. Thank you.